Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with asparagus patties. That's right, it's officially spring, which is when a young man's fancy lightly turns the thoughts of love and also experimenting with vegetables. But of course, not at the same time. But anyway, the point is it's spring. And besides lots of thoughts of love, there's also lots of asparagus at the market. And since I'm always on a quest for new and exciting ways to cook it, I tried a little bit of an experiment and joined it in patty form, which really did come out quite well. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by bringing some salted water to a boil. And by the way, when I say salted water in the context of cooking vegetables, I'm not talking about salting water like this. All right, that's just a big pinch. That does nothing. We're going to want to use like a spoon of salt. All right, that is one of the all-time secrets for cooking flavorful vegetables. And once properly salted, we'll bring that water to a boil on high heat. And once that water is boiling, we will use that to blanch our asparagus. And prepping that will be the next step. And what we have here is your standard one pound bunch of fresh spring asparagus. And as far as prep goes, all we really need to do is remove the woody bottom of the spear if necessary. And one trick you always hear on how to do that is to sort of bend the bottom of the spear like this. And they say it will snap right where the two tufty part starts. Except that's not always the case. All right, that little part was okay. So generally, I'm not a snapper, I'm more of a slicer. And these spears were pretty good and didn't require much trimming. And you can go one by one checking them out. Or you can go restaurant prep cook style and simply cut the bottom inch off every spear to play it safe. But anyway, we'll go ahead and trim the bottoms of those spears if necessary. At which point I decided to cut these in half. Which by the way, you might not have to do. All right, I'm only doing that so they fit in my pan of boiling water. Speaking of which, once our water is boiling, We'll go ahead and transfer that asparagus in, where we will cook it for only two to three minutes. And that's sort of gonna depend on the thickness of the spear. But regardless, we're just gonna give this a very brief blanching, mostly to lock in that green color, but also to tenderize these just a little bit. So it's not so much that we're cooking the asparagus here, it's more that we're making the asparagus not raw. And then what we'll do after that's been in the water for a couple minutes is go ahead and transfer that into some ice cold water, which I should mention is not the same as water with ice in it. All right, as I've said before, save your ice cubes for your Manhattans. Just a big bowl of very cold water will do the job and stop the cooking. So we'll go ahead and let that asparagus cool completely in the water. And while we're waiting, we can go ahead and grate our cheese. And what I have here is exactly a one ounce piece of pecorino, although some Parmigiano Reggiano would also work beautifully. And the reason I'm gonna show you this not so interesting grating scene is because there's often a lot of confusion about cheese measurements and recipes. And the reason for that is if you call for an ounce of grated cheese and people try to convert that to cups, it'll tell you to put it in about a quarter to a third of a cup. But check it out. If you grate an ounce of this hard cheese on a microplane, it will pretty much fill a cup, which according to the internet is about four ounces of cheese. Except it's not, it's one ounce. And therein lies the confusion, which I may have just added to. But anyway, the point is we're gonna grate exactly one ounce of cheese and doing that by weight is the most accurate. And by now, after that long, tortured explanation, our asparagus should be cold. And assuming it is, we'll drain that very well, and then proceed to slice it up in very, very small pieces. And of course, for an operation like this, we're definitely going to want to keep our fingertips bent back away from the knife. I mean, that just seems like common sense, but a lot of people don't do that. And since this was sort of an experiment, I wasn't exactly sure how small to slice this. All right, I was shooting for the largest pieces possible that would still hold together. And in hindsight, I probably could have cut it a little smaller but we'll go over that. And then what we'll do once our asparagus is sliced up is add that to a bowl and proceed with the rest of the ingredients, which will include a nice big pinch of salt, as well as a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. And then we'll also go ahead and shake in a little bit of cayenne just to stay in shape. And then once we've added our seasonings, we can move on to the binding agents. And here we're gonna be using three of them. All right, the first will be our grated cheese. I know it looks like a ton, but it's only one ounce. We will also add to that some dry breadcrumbs. And then last but not least, a beaten egg. And we'll go ahead and take a spatula and mix this up. And anytime we're doing something like this and we're not sure if it should be one or two eggs, always start with one egg. Since it's super easy to add more egg and literally impossible to remove some. So I started with just one and I gave it a mix. And as I stirred this together, it became apparent I was gonna need that extra egg. So I stopped and added that in and continued mixing. And my overall game plan here was to have the maximum amount of asparagus possible, with just enough binder to keep those patties together so they didn't fall apart in the pan. But clearly one egg wasn't gonna be enough. 
And as you can see after stirring that second egg in, the mixture looked a lot better and much more patty-able. And then what we'll do once that's set is grab some to help portion these. Either some kind of spoon or one of these scoops, which I really like for portioning things evenly. And we'll go ahead and head over to the stove where we're gonna cook these in a little bit of olive oil over medium heat. And once I had that mixture placed in, I took a fork and kind of flattened it out a little bit, since that just seemed like a smart thing to do. And we're gonna to wanna to cook these for about four minutes aside or until nicely browned and cooked through. And I have to admit after about four minutes when I went to turn these, I was pretty sure they were gonna to totally crumble apart. But much to my surprise and delight, they actually held together quite nicely. And I just used the spatula to bring any rogue pieces back into the collective. And that's it, we'll give that side about four minutes. At which point they looked done and sort of felt done and that the inside didn't feel raw and mushy. So I figured it was time to get these out of the pan and onto a plate. And yes, one piece of asparagus did fall out, but let's not speak of that. Instead, let's go ahead and garnish this with a nice spoon of lemon aioli. And we will finish up with some lemon zest. And that's it. What we are calling asparagus patties are done and looking very, very seasonably appropriate. All right, the surface almost looks like there's green plants starting to sprout up through the cold, dark soil. By the way, I stole that brilliant observation from my wife, Michelle. But anyway, I really did think this looked gorgeous. So I grabbed a fork to make sure it tasted just as good. And it really, really did. Like I said, I wanted this to be as asparagus-y as possible, with just the minimum amount of other ingredients needed to hold this together. So for an experiment, it really did come out nicely, and would have held together even better if we cut our asparagus a little bit smaller, which I may do next time. Or not. It'll depend on my mood. And while this was absolutely delicious with that lemon aioli, these would probably be really good with other sauces like a hollandaise maybe. Or how about a remoulade? Or maybe we serve them even simpler with just some fresh lemon juice. Okay, so if you do make these, feel free to experiment. I mean, you are, after all, the Brittany of your spears. And speaking of oops, I did it again. I've never not regretted using lemon zest in one of these videos. I mean, it looks nice on camera, but I'm not sure that justifies how annoying it is. What we probably should have done is just use the microplane and just grate a little zest on there. Anyway, having said that, life is way too short to get upset over those kind of minor issues. What I really should be focusing on is just how fantastic this really was and how much I really hope you give these a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. cream of asparagus soup. That's right, I'm gonna show you how to make this unbelievably easy and classic spring soup. And if you're wondering, does it taste as delicious as it looks? You bet your asparagus it does. But anyway, we always get lots of food wishes for vegetable soups, and this is one of my all-time favorites. And it's always a great sign when a recipe starts with a chunk of butter. So we're gonna melt some butter over medium heat in a soup pot. As soon as that melts, we're gonna dump in a finely diced onion, along with a large pinch of salt. And the reason I diced it small is because we want this to soften and sweeten, and that will happen quicker if the pieces are a little smaller. And because the asparagus cooks so quickly in this recipe, we need to make sure the onions are perfectly soft in this stage. Otherwise, you're gonna be pureeing undercooked onions into your soup, and it will just not have that same delicious sweet flavor. So take your time, make sure they get nice and soft and golden. That took me about 10 minutes or so. And at that point, we're gonna add some chicken broth and or stock. Of course, you can use vegetable stock. I'm also gonna add a couple cups of water. And then we're gonna raise the heat up to high to bring this up to a simmer because I wanna simmer those onions for another 15 minutes. And that's for two reasons. It's gonna make sure the onions are beautifully sweet and fully cooked. And it's also gonna give us the perfect amount of time to prep our asparagus. So let it come up to a simmer on high, then reduce your heat to medium and just let it simmer like that while you work on your asparagus. So we're gonna head over to the cutting board. We're gonna grab a few spears in our hand. We're gonna cut the tips off and then simply go down the spear about every inch, cutting like that. And by the way, we are gonna strain this, so do not worry about the woodiness near the bottom. You can cut all the way. And that is all there is to it. You can do that, right? That's what I thought. So we're gonna to wanna to do about two pounds of that. Of course, those have been thoroughly washed first. Once that's done and once our stock has simmered for 15 minutes, go ahead and dump in the asparagus. We're gonna turn the heat back onto high. And we're gonna cook that asparagus, stirring occasionally for about, I don't know, five to 10 minutes or until they're just barely tender. They should still stay somewhat green, 
But if you take the back of a wooden spoon and press it against your pot, they will smash. And that is the perfect doneness right there. So we don't want to undercook them, just trying to keep them bright green. All right, we need to cook it long enough to get rid of that bitterness. And of course, on the other hand, we don't want to go too far. Otherwise, they're just going to get all mushy. That color will turn kind of a yucky gray green, and nobody wants to look at that. So try to get them right in that sweet spot, literally, where they're still green, but just barely tender. Once that happens, you're going to turn off the heat, and we're going to puree this perfectly smooth. I'm going to use a stick blender. You can use a regular blender or food processor. Be very careful, of course. And by the way, I was experimenting here with an overhead light on the stove, but it was making these brutal shadows, which was really bothering me. So let me turn that off. There we go. And this, of course, is time lapse. That took about three minutes. You want to get it as smooth as possible. All right, it's going to look something like that. I just love that color green. So beautiful. Okay, now that that's done, you could eat the soup like this, but I'm going to suggest we strain it to make the texture a little finer, a little fancier. So we're just going to pass that through a mesh strainer. And you can see it's going to catch all those tougher fibers. So if your spears were sporting wood at the bottom, this is going to catch all of that. So anyway, there we go. Mine strained, looking gorgeous. We're going to turn the heat back on to low at this point. We're going to season it up with a little bit of cayenne pepper, some finely and freshly ground black pepper, a good amount of salt. Under seasoned vegetable soups are the devil's playground. So a nice big pinch of salt. And then it is, after all, called cream of asparagus. So I'm going to throw in a half a cup of heavy cream. All right, it sounds funny to say that cream is optional in a cream of asparagus, but it really is. If you're really watching the calories, it could be omitted, but it really does increase the gorgeousness of this soup by, I'm going to say, I don't know, 50 to 60%. So I hope you put some in. By the way, extra credit if you use homemade creme fraiche. That is just unreal in this. All right. And believe it or not, that cream of asparagus soup is pretty much done. Of course, we're going to give it one last taste just to be sure. And once you're happy with it, you can go ahead and start ladling that up into some hot bowls. But I'm going to show you one extra optional step because I know you fancy yourself as some kind of gourmet foodie type person. We're going to do a little lemon Parmesan cream. And all that is is a splash of whipping cream in a bowl. We're going to add some finely grated Reggiano Parmesan, a little bit of lemon zest, and we're just going to whisk that up for just a minute. It's just going to thicken ever so slightly. All we're doing is introducing a little bit of air so that it kind of sits up on the surface of the soup, and you'll see in one second. So ladle your soup into the bowl. Drizzle a little bit of that Parmesan lemon cream on top. We'll take a wooden skewer and give it a little stir to give it kind of a design. All right, don't try to do a design. Do this mindlessly. Let the bamboo think for you. And once you've done that, maybe a little more lemon zest, maybe a little sprinkle of cayenne, the red merging with that yellow to form orange, which will remind everybody of sunny days and that warmer spring weather that's right around the corner. And how did it taste? Incredible. We're going to stir in that creamy topping. The texture is so smooth and silky. The flavor is just pure asparagus in all its sweet, mild glory. Just a perfect bowl of asparagus goodness. Oh, and by the way, you know whose favorite soup this is? Britney Spears. So anyway, like I said, I always get lots of food wishes for easy vegetable soups, and this certainly is one of the easiest and most delicious of all time. So I really hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Asparagus souffle. That's right, we're getting all fancy. Well, actually, that's not true. Souffle is not that fancy. It's actually pretty basic and extremely fun. So it looks like that coming out of the oven. That's what it looks like when we serve it. Yes, it's deflated. We will explain. That's not a problem. Relax. All right, so here we go. I'm going to take one bunch of asparagus. I'm going to cut the tips off. And then I'm going to cut the spears in like, I don't know, half inch pieces. Don't go all the way down. You want to stop when it starts getting woody. All right, no one's ever tasted a souffle and said, all right, this is good, but I wish it was a little woodier. So we only want the tender parts. I'm gonna boil that in salted water for only like two minutes. I just want it to turn bright green. I don't necessarily want it to get tender or soft. I just want it to start to cook. So two minutes in the boiling water. I'm gonna fish it out into some very cold water, preferably ice water, all right? But it doesn't have to be ice in it as long as it's very cold. That's gonna stop the cooking. And that is ready, set that aside. Now we're going to make a bechamel, a very basic white sauce. We've made these so many times before. Okay, so equal parts butter and flour on medium heat. The butter melts. It forms a paste with the flour. It will look like that. I'm not sure you people that are emailing me having problems with roux, what the problem is. Because it's, I don't know. I'm not sure what can go wrong. 
All right, after we cook that for about two minutes, I'm gonna whisk in one cup of cold, ice cold milk. Because we use hot roux and cold milk, we don't get lumps. So whisk that in till smooth, and that will thicken fully as it comes back to a simmer, which is gonna take two or three minutes. At that point, we're basically done. I'm gonna season with some salt and some cayenne. I'm gonna mix that in. That was some quality editing there. We're gonna transfer that into a blender with one half clove raw garlic. I'm gonna take my very well-drained asparagus pieces, dump those in, pulse it on and off in the blender until extremely, extremely smooth. I'm gonna pour that asparagus and bechamel puree into a mixing bowl. We are going to separate four large eggs. I like to do it through my fingers. The whites will run through your fingers into one bowl, and then you reserve the egg yolks and add those to the asparagus puree. All right, so you got that? So four yolks go in the asparagus mixture. The four whites are in a separate bowl. I'm gonna dump in half a cup of finely grated cheese. I'm using Parmesan, but just between you and me, I wish it was white cheddar. I prefer that, but Parmesan's good. Don't get me wrong. All right, go ahead and mix that in, set that aside. Now, before we beat our egg whites, we wanna prep our ramekins and preheat our oven. All right, the oven's gonna be 375. I'm gonna prep my ramekins with some butter. Grease them generously. Our ramekins are prepped. I'm gonna beat the egg whites till not stiff. All right, I wanna beat them to like soft peaks form. I want it soft and voluptuous. It should look like a beautiful, curvaceous woman wrapped in a really soft cotton sheet. You can see that, right? There's the arm, the elbow. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna add half the egg whites to the asparagus mixture and just stir that in to lighten it up. We're gonna use a light touch, but we're not gonna be too, too, too gentle. Just kind of stir it in. Once the first half sort of disappears into that, we're gonna add the second half of the egg whites. And this time we are gonna be a little more careful, but we're still not gonna be all, you know, super, super delicate. We're gonna fold it in, which means bring the spatula up from the bottom and the sides up over the top. And basically just do that until it's mixed in just barely. See that, looks like that. You can still see little remnants of egg white here and there. That's fine, that's perfect. Once that's done, I'm gonna fill up my ramekins about three quarters of the way. Now you can get probably six, six ounce ramekins out of this recipe. I'm only gonna do four here. I basically wanted to experiment with baking the batter later after everything's been mixed to see what would happen. And you can read about that little experiment on the blog. All right, we're gonna put those in 375 for about 20 minutes, 20 to 25, until they look like that. Look at those, so beautiful. By the way, hurry up and look, because they're gonna fall any second. That's right, as soon as you take them out, they're gonna deflate, and they're gonna look like that when you serve it. That's how it's supposed to look. If you wanted people to see them all puffed up, bring them into the kitchen when you take them out of the oven, but that's not how you're supposed to serve them. If you serve it like that right out of the oven, way too hot to taste, and it's gonna deflate anyway, so don't even bother. All right, so let me dig into this soft, supple, foamy, just pure asparagus flavor, so delicious. Anyway, there you go, asparagus souffle. I felt like doing something, I don't know, a little around the fancy end. Not really very fancy when you come down to it. Just beautiful, fresh green vegetable puree, a little bit of white sauce, a little bit of cheese, and then of course, the magic of the egg foam. Anyway, I hope you give this a try. All the ingredients are on the site, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Prosciutto wrapped asparagus. By the way, I'm doing this voiceover from a hotel room in San Antonio, so it sounds a little weird. Y'all, please forgive me. All right, here we go. Two ingredients only, believe it or not, prosciutto and asparagus. Not the most picturesque, beautiful recipe ever, but incredibly flavorful, tasty, and oh so easy. So here we go. You're gonna take a bunch of asparagus. Thicker, the better. If you wanna snap the bottoms off like all those famous chefs show you on TV, don't do it. I don't like that. We're gonna eat these with our hands, so I need like a little asparagus handle at the bottom. So who says you gotta eat all the way to the bottom? Why not not trim it and just eat until it's not tender anymore? How about that for a system? All right, we're gonna take some thin slices of prosciutto, get the Italian stuff. I'm only gonna use a half a slice because it's very strong and we don't need a lot. Directly in the center of the spear. Start with the flat end, the cut end, and just roll it up towards the rounded end and it will seal just like that. Super easy. 
All right, so you're going to wrap up all your asparagus, put it on a silicone lined mat, seam side down. No salt, no oil. I'll explain that in a minute. That goes in a 450 degree oven for about six minutes, five, six minutes, until you can see the prosciutto start to give up its fat. It will actually start kind of sizzling, bubbling on the bottom of the pan. So I'm gonna test this with a paring knife. They're just starting to get tender at this point. We're gonna use that fat to flavor the asparagus. That's gonna provide the salt and the richness. That's why we didn't need any olive oil or any you know, salt at the beginning. So take a pastry brush or a silicone brush, just wipe it on the pan. You're gonna get plenty of oil, brush it over everything, Put it back in the oven until the asparagus is just tender, okay? You want it to be still fairly firm, and that's kind of the best test as you wiggle it. It'll wiggle, but it won't droop. Wiggle good, droop bad. I just burned my finger, by the way. All right, use tongs. And that's it. Put it on a serving plate. This is best served room temperature, in my opinion. Certainly, you can eat it warm. And the reason I like to wrap the prosciutto directly in the center is it makes for a perfect three-bite system. The first bite is the tip of the asparagus with just a little bit of prosciutto. The middle bite, almost all the prosciutto, that's like the meat bite. And then for dessert, we finish with the bottom, which is again, mostly asparagus. And that's it, nice little appetizer. Spring is here, asparagus has sprung. It's in all the stores, farmer's markets. Go get some asparagus and a little bit of prosciutto and you can make this delicious first course appetizer snack, whatever you wanna call it. All the ingredients are on the site, both of them. So go to Food Wishes and check it out. And as always, enjoy. Roasted asparagus with prosciutto bits and poached egg. This is a great thing for spring. You can get asparagus year round, but in the spring, it just seems extra special. All right, so we're gonna start with a heavy duty skillet on medium low heat with about a tablespoon or so of olive oil. And to it, I'm gonna add some minced prosciutto. Right now, there are Italians running to get visas to fly to the United States to kick my ass. Why? Because you're not supposed to chop up prosciutto and cook it. You're supposed to eat it thinly sliced as God intended. But I want everyone to relax. This is made using prosciutto scraps. This was actually sold, already chopped up in a package at a significant discount. So if you go to an Italian grocery or deli where they slice fresh prosciutto, when they get down to the end, the slices don't look so great. And a lot of times they will sell those small pieces at the end at a discount. So now this is going to cook in the oven with the asparagus when it roasts. I just want to basically render a little bit of the fat out and it's really going to flavor the olive oil in the pan. Okay, so I'm only talking about three or four minutes until it looks like that. I'm gonna bring it over to my baking dish where I have one bunch of trimmed large asparagus. I'm gonna douse that with some extra virgin olive oil to which I'm gonna add my cooked prosciutto bits. So now the prosciutto flavored oil is mixing in with that extra virgin olive oil and it is gonna be incredible. I'm gonna add a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. You don't need any salt because when you cook prosciutto, it really brings out the saltiness, okay? So be careful. Toss that really well. We want to make sure all the asparagus is coated with that marvelously flavored oil. That's going to go in a hot oven, 425, for 10 minutes. But it's not done because after 10 minutes, we're going to give it a toss, okay? It's going to just start getting tender, but it probably isn't all the way there yet. So it's going to go back in for five minutes until firm yet tender. And one test here, if you grab the asparagus by the bottom and give it a wiggle, it should wiggle, meaning it is tender to the bite, but it shouldn't droop. That would mean it was overcooked. All right, to finish, I'm gonna cut a lemon. I'm gonna drizzle over some lemon juice to taste. I used about a half a lemon. I'm gonna give that a toss. I'm gonna throw that on a plate. I'm gonna sprinkle our prosciutto bits over the top. I'm gonna add a poached egg. And you see, I usually never include the outtakes, but here I missed. It slid off the asparagus. I was, I was not happy, so I refilmed it. Okay, that's better. And by the way, relax. I know. How'd you poach the egg? You didn't show us how to poach the egg. I will actually be redoing that demo because the old one, the old how to poach an egg, pretty low quality. So stay tuned for that. I'm going to finish with a little bit of lemon zest, a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. And you know what's coming next, don't you? Oh, yeah. And we're going to take that perfectly roasted asparagus scented with that prosciutto fat. We're gonna dip it in that sticky yolk. 
and we're going to eat that whole thing just like that. In fact, if you're lucky, your yolk will be so perfectly cooked, it will actually be thick and sticky enough to pick up the bits of prosciutto. And yes, that's right, mine was, so there. Okay, you can also do this with fried egg or over easy, just as good, almost. But poached egg is traditional. And there you go, roasted asparagus, a spring classic. It's just so simple, so perfect. There's just nothing not delicious about this. Get some crusty bread, makes a great first course, a great breakfast, a great dinner, a great anything. Just eat it. So I hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Bacon and asparagus Dutch baby. That's right, this puffy baked pancake is just not for breakfast anymore. Although, having said that, this would make a spectacular breakfast, especially with a fried or poached egg on top. In fact, if Father's Day brunch was a thing, this could be perfect. I mean, I think your dad would love this so much, he'll probably even forget you got him another tie for a gift. But anyway, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, because before we worry about how and when to serve this, we need to show you how to put this together. So let's go ahead and get started with our batter, and that will begin with three large eggs. And then to that we will add some whole milk, or 2%, or skim, really doesn't matter here. We also want to toss in some finely and freshly grated Parmesan. Of course the real stuff from Italy. I mean seriously, what kind of crazy person is using the fake stuff with the sawdust in it? So we will add a little bit of real cheese, please. And then of course we have to season this up with some kosher salt, a little bit or a lot of cayenne, as well as some freshly ground black pepper. And then I thought this would be very nice with a little touch of lemon flavor, but I didn't want the acidity. So what we'll do is we'll just grate in some lemon zest, which will give us that lemoniness we want without having to add the juice. And then last but not least, we need some flour, so we'll dump that in. And that is gonna be it for our batter ingredients. So we'll take a whisk and we'll give this a mix. And by the way, generally when we make batters like this, we include some type of fat, like shortening or oil or melted butter or something like that. But with this we don't, because we're gonna have plenty of fat in the pan when we add this to our bacon and asparagus. So just in case you were wondering, where the heck's the fat? Well, we're gonna have plenty. So we will give that a thoughtful and thorough mixing until everything's completely combined. And if you think you're seeing tiny little lumps, you're not, that's just pieces of cheese. But anyway, once that's mixed up, we'll simply set it aside and move on to the asparagus. And what we want to do here is take our fresh raw spears, and starting with the tip end, we're going to slice across like this into roughly, I don't know, quarter inch pieces, all the way down to the bottom, well maybe down to the bottom. If it gets a little tougher woody when you get to the end, don't use that piece. So you should be able to feel with a knife if it's tender or not. So of course we will discard anything we think is inedible. And by the way, the great thing about cutting asparagus like this is that if you overcook it or undercook it a little, nobody will notice. Because we've cut these in such short lengths, we've taken the fibers out of play. And once that's set, we can head over to the stove to start our bacon. So I'm gonna slice up about six strips of bacon and add it to this heavy duty cast iron pan set over medium heat. And I did add a couple teaspoons of olive oil to this pan first to get things started. Because as you'll see, for this technique to work, we do need a good amount of fat in the pan. And what we want to do is cook this bacon until pretty much all the fat's rendered out and it starts to get crisp. And by the way, you really do need one of these cast iron pans for this technique to work perfectly. But if you don't, I will give you one alternative on the blog post. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and cook our bacon. And once it's looking something similar to this, we'll go ahead and dump in our asparagus. And also raise our heat to the highest setting. And we'll give that a little stir. And we only want to cook this about a minute. And I realize it looks like we have two or three tablespoons of extra fat we don't need, but we do. Remember, there's no fat in the batter. Okay, so you can blot out some of that if you want, but we really do need three or four tablespoons for this technique to work properly. And then once our asparagus is cooked for about a minute on the highest heat we have, we can go ahead and pour in our batter, but not all in one spot. So I like to pour mine in like this, in kind of a circular motion. And then as soon as that batter has been introduced, we don't want to stir it. We just want to quickly and carefully transfer that into the center of our preheated 475 degree oven for about 12 minutes or so, or until puffed and beautifully browned. And if everything's gone according to plan, it should look something like this. Check it out. And while no one's exactly sure how this got its name, when you set something that looks like that down in the middle of a table, you will often hear people say, oh baby. Now fair warning, this will deflate as soon as it comes out of the oven. So if you're trying to impress people visually, make sure this goes straight from the oven to the table. See, this is only like two minutes later, and it's pretty much settled down. 
but still looking incredibly enticing. And this really isn't something we need to let rest a long time, because by the time you cut and plate this, it's going to be perfectly ready to eat. So we will cut a nice wedge and serve that up. And that's it, our bacon asparagus Dutch baby is ready to enjoy. And if you've never had one of these before, they're not that easy to describe. I guess I would say it's like a cross between a pancake and an omelet. A love child, if you will, because it kind of has the characteristics of both. And I really do love that contrast between the soft custardy parts and those crusty edges studded with crispy bacon. That's just a beautiful combination. And while I really do love bacon and asparagus for this, there are so many other combinations that would work. We could do a pancetta and zucchini Dutch baby, or a sausage and potato Dutch baby, or a, well, you get the idea. So feel free to experiment and use what you want. I mean, you are the baby daddy. And not only is this fast and versatile, it pretty much will work for any meal. Breakfast, brunch, lunch, dinner, as well as, and I've heard this from a friend, makes for a great midnight snack. So I really do hope you give this savory Dutch baby a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Asparagus tart. That's right, I really wanted to call this asparagus raft, but unfortunately that's not a thing, so we're going with tart. And the usual reason for making these is my love of asparagus, but this time it was my love of using up puff pastry that I found in the freezer. So that's what happened this time, and this was the result. So let me show you how to put this together, and the first thing you're gonna need to do is find some frozen puff pastry in your freezer. Or of course buy some. And we're gonna put that down on a silpat lined baking sheet. And as you can see here, that's fully thawed. Very important, it's gotta be thawed all the way. And the reason we want this fully thawed is because the first step here is we're gonna go around the edge and kind of fold it over and roll it up to make the outside crust. So I'm gonna go around with my fingers, kind of folding it, rolling it up like this. And actually, as you can see here, one finger does a fantastic job. And don't worry about trying to make it perfect. This is a rustic tart, okay? And after we've gone around and rolled up that edge, we're gonna take a fork and we're gonna start pricking it. And we're gonna prick it and we're gonna continue pricking it until it's fully and completely pricked over. However, we don't call it pricking. That doesn't sound good. We call it docking. And then once that's been completely and utterly docked, we're gonna go ahead and pop that in a 400 degree oven for 10 minutes. And this is just the pre-baking. It's gonna get baked again. So we're gonna pop that in for 10 minutes. And when it comes out, you're gonna be thinking, why did you just make us do all that work? All right, and that's understandable because it doesn't look like we did anything, but fear not. Check this out. We're gonna take the back of a fork, and while this is still hot, we're just gonna press it down with the back of the fork like that, and the part of the dough that we docked will flatten out, and as you'll see, the part we rolled up around the edge will stay just like that. Okay, so hopefully everybody feels better now. And then all we're gonna do is just let that sit there and cool while we prep our asparagus, which is super easy, because all we're gonna do is give them a very quick boil, and I mean quick. So what we'll do is we'll bring some generously salted water to a boil, we're gonna throw in our trimmed asparagus spears, and we're only gonna let these cook for 60 seconds. This is referred to as blanching. And of course that technique was named after its inventor, Chef Blanche, you guys will believe anything, Tun. But anyway, like I said, we're just gonna give it 60 seconds, and then we're gonna fish it out into some ice water. And I say ice water, cause that's what they told us to use in culinary school, but I always just use very cold water, and it works every time. So save your ice for the margaritas. And then as soon as those are cold, go ahead and drain that, and reserve until needed. And then besides the pastry and the asparagus, we're gonna to need to do a little bit of a creamy mustard sauce for the bottom. So in a ramekin, we're gonna take a spoon of Dijon, a little spoon of creme fraiche or sour cream, some freshly ground black pepper, and a pinch of cayenne. And then we'll mix that up well. And you'll notice I'm not putting any salt in here. Our pastry has salt in it. And of course we blanched our asparagus in very well salted water. So the seasoning should be fine. Plus we're gonna to top this with a little bit of Parmesan. So anyway, we're gonna mix up that sauce. And then once that's thoroughly mixed up, we'll take a couple teaspoons and we'll spread it evenly into the bottom of our now cooled tart shell. All right, not too little, not too much. I'm recommending you use the perfect amount as seen here. And then once that's done, we're gonna go ahead and take our now drained and dried asparagus spears and lay them in. And as we're laying these in here, let me go ahead and say something super obvious. You're gonna need to trim these asparagus so they fit perfectly inside your tart shell. I mean, the original shape of your puff pastry should be close, but of course you might have to do some fine tuning and trimming. And of course, how many you get in here depends on the size. I was shooting for five, but right about here, I was like, hey, you know what? You could sneak another one in there. Let's do it, which I did. So for me, six fit perfectly. And then once our asparagus has been placed in, let's go ahead and take a little bit of melted butter and brush that over the spears. All right, brushing things with butter before they go in the oven is usually never a bad idea. And sure, if you got a couple extra drops, 
Go ahead and brush a little bit on the crust. Although that stuff's like 60% butter anyway, so it doesn't matter, but still. And then last but not least, before this goes in the oven, we're going to give that a very light dusting of Parmesan. And have I mentioned lately you should use the really expensive Parmigiano Reggiano? Okay, so we're going to give that a light but thorough dusting. And then that's going to go back in our 400 degree oven for about 10 to 12 minutes or until it looks like this. Check it out. That's pretty. That's real pretty. Your crust should be perfectly golden brown. And the color on that asparagus is going to deepen a little, but it should be still a very beautiful dark green. Now, at this point, I'm usually telling you to let it cool down a little bit. You really don't have to in this case. You can serve this piping hot. You can serve this warm. You can serve this room temperature. This, believe it or not, is even good cold. So very versatile. So at that point, we're going to go ahead and plate that up. I serve mine with a little charred pepper and arugula salad. That's charred red pepper and arugula. Oil vinegar. Okay? But anyway, that's it. Simple asparagus tart. I mean, for how gorgeous that looks, that was actually pretty easy. Just a brilliant combination of that crispy, buttery pastry, that sweet, still almost firm, but perfectly tender asparagus, and then just that little touch of creamy mustard sauce underneath, bringing the two main components together. It's just an excellent thing to eat. And speaking of that sauce, don't worry if you think it's going to make everything soggy. It doesn't. Check this out. That bottom's still going to be beautifully brown and crispy. So asparagus should be very abundant right now. And literally every grocery store in the country that has a freezer case sells frozen puff pastry. And because of those two things I just said, I really hope you give this a try. All right? So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Shaved asparagus salad. That's right, I got good news and bad news. Chef John has joined the raw food revolution. And I know you're wondering, is that the good news or the bad news? That's the bad news. The good news is, though, we're going to top this with fried pastrami. And this ended up being one of the most delicious asparagus salads I've ever had. So let me show you how to put this together. In step one, we're going to go ahead and get our dressing made ahead of time. And because I'm going to use the smoky cured awesomeness that is pastrami, we're going to go with a very simple, slightly sweet mustard dressing. So into a bowl, I'm going to throw in about a tablespoon of Dijon mustard to which we're gonna add some seasoned rice vinegar, which as you well know, has a little bit of sweetness to it. And we'll give that a quick mix. And then all we're gonna to do to finish this up is drizzle in while whisking a couple tablespoons of olive oil. And thanks to the mustard, this is gonna emulsify fairly easily. So I'm drizzling kind of slow, but not too slow. And after drizzling while whisking enthusiastically, it should look something like this. Then we can go ahead and put that aside while we prep our asparagus. And there it is, some washed raw asparagus. And what we're going to use to shave this is a nice, sharp vegetable peeler. And since the bottom of the asparagus is going to be the toughest and most fibrous, we'll actually hold that end and peel towards the top like this. And what you're going to end up getting are these beautiful, thin, long strips of raw asparagus. And other than that part at the bottom that you're holding, you should pretty much be able to peel most of the asparagus beer. Which reminds me, one pro tip, buy a little extra asparagus and then make soup the next day with that and the scraps from this recipe. Oh, it's the perfect system. But anyway, we're going to continue peeling until we have a nice tangle of asparagus shavings, which we're going to go ahead and transfer into a bowl where we will begin the dressing process. By the way, only do this step if you're ready to eat. All right, this is not something you can dress ahead of time. But anyway, assuming we are ready to eat, we're going to go ahead and throw in a big, big pinch of salt, very key. A little touch of cayenne, just a little touch, along with some freshly ground black pepper, and then just enough of our mustard dressing to coat. And then what we're going to do is give that a thorough mix, and we'll let it sit there for two or three minutes to just soften slightly. Are you going to be able to feel as you mix this, even though those shavings are very thin, they still have a little rigidity to them, but that's going to soften over the next couple minutes. You're going to be amazed. But anyway, we're going to mix that up, set that aside for a couple minutes, which is going to give us the perfect amount of time to fry our pastrami. So I'm going to go ahead and take a couple slices of pastrami and slice it up. All right, if you live next to a deli, get the good stuff. I was forced to use some unremarkable and fairly wet supermarket pastrami, although the quality was very good and it worked beautifully. But anyway, we're going to slice that up, and then we'll go ahead and put a pan on medium-high heat with a little drizzle of oil, and we'll simply fry that stirring for a couple minutes. And as far as doneness goes, you have a couple options. We can just barely warm this and serve it like that, or we can go all the way to the other end of the spectrum and fry it till it's almost crisp. But keep in mind, the more you fry it, the more you're going to intensify that salty, spicy, pastrami flavor, which I want here. That's what I'm going for. But I do want you to keep in mind, the more you fry it, the saltier it's going to get. So for me, I kept stirring and cooking until it looked just about like that. And that looks very close. 
Maybe I'll give that one more minute or so. And when you think your pastrami is getting close to where you want it, we'll go ahead and plate up our shaved asparagus, which as you can see has wilted a little bit. It's still nice and bright and fairly crisp, but it's just relaxed a little bit, kind of slumped down a little bit. So that's perfect right there. And I'm assuming you figured the rest out. Let's go ahead and plate that up. What we're going for is artfully unarranged. So arrange it, but don't make it look like you tried to arrange it. You know, kind of like a Russian election. And then of course to finish, we're gonna go ahead and top it with our fried pastrami. And as I put the last few pieces of pastrami on top, I was thinking, what should I garnish this with? And the rule of thumb is if you can't think of anything within five seconds, you do not need a garnish. All right, kids, so remember that. That's the other five second rule. So I decided to serve it as is, and that shaved asparagus salad with fried pastrami and mustard dressing is done. And as I dig in here, I'm fairly confident in saying, if you like asparagus, you're gonna love this. And by love, I mean go nuts for. It is so delicious. And the spice notes in that pastrami, the black pepper and the coriander work perfectly, perfectly with this vegetable. And of course the contrast between the temperatures of that cold raw salad and the fried meat on top, just nothing short of fantastic. But anyway, that's it. Asparagus should be fairly abundant right now. And eventually you're gonna get tired of eating it in those same old ways. And hopefully when that happens, you remember this. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Creamy asparagus and cauliflower soup. That's right, it's very rare I make asparagus and or cauliflower soup. I mean, I say I do, but by the time I'm done adding things like cream, cheese, butter, and bacon, that's nothing more than a delicious lie. So anyway, this time I decided to actually make a real asparagus and cauliflower soup. And this is how we're going to do it. So step one, let's go ahead and put a saucepan or soup pot on medium heat. And then that we're going to sizzle some garlic and a little bit of olive oil. And by a little bit, I mean a couple tablespoons, which is actually more than you need to saute the garlic. But that's not the only reason it's in here. All right, that olive oil is going to provide a little extra richness in what's otherwise a fat-free soup. And besides, I'm not sure who said it. It probably was me. But don't think of olive oil as fat. Think of olive oil as food. Because that's what it is. But anyway, we're going to sizzle that garlic for just about a minute. We really don't want any color on it. And at that point, we're going to add about six cups of liquid. Now I'm going to use a combination. I had about four cups of chicken broth that I made the other day out of an old roast chicken carcass. And I only had about four cups of that. So I went ahead and added a couple cups of water. And once that's in, we'll go ahead and raise our heat to medium high because we want to bring this up to a simmer. And while we're waiting for that to happen, let's go ahead and prep our cauliflower, which is going to be super easy because all we're going to do is break up one head and you could just use brute force and pull it apart with your hands. But since we can pretty much use everything, I just grab a knife and hack it up like this. And once we've cut that, we can go ahead and dump that into our pot. And then all we're going to do is just simmer this cauliflower until it's completely tender. So like I said, our heat's on medium high. And while we're waiting for that to start bubbling, we could season this up a little bit. And we're going to go with some freshly ground black pepper, a little shake of cayenne just to stay in shape, and a big pinch of salt. And we'll go ahead and give that a stir. And then basically all we're going to do is wait for this to start simmering and then back the heat down to medium low and just maintain a gentle simmer until that cauliflower is completely tender. And that's probably going to take about 15 minutes or so. So while that's happening, let's go ahead and prep our asparagus. And to do that, we're going to want to trim off those woody bottoms. And you see some chefs on television showing you this method where you grab the bottom and you bend it like this. And they say wherever that snaps, that's where the tender part of the asparagus starts. So I gave that a try and it kind of works, except that bottom flew under my refrigerator. Oh, don't worry, I promise I'll pick that up the next time we buy a new refrigerator. So like I said, this method does kind of work, but it takes too long. You got to do one at a time. I mean, I'm busy running an international money laundering and video recipe cartel. I do not have time to snap individual spears. So I like to use a knife and trim a bunch at once, and the blade of the knife will tell you where to cut in. See, I start to cut here, and I could feel it was way too fibrous and tough. So I moved it up a little bit. Boom, tenderness. So that's my method, very fast and effective. Of course, if you're going to strain the soup, which I'm not going to, you don't really have to trim much because those fibers will be strained out. And then once the asparagus bottoms are trimmed off, we're going to cut this asparagus up in pieces. All right, the tops are pretty tender, so we can make a big cut there. Oh, and by the way, I like to save a few of these tips for garnish. So I'm going to set a few aside to blanch and use later. But anyway, we're going to continue to cut down. And the closer I get to the bottom, the smaller I like to make the cuts. Because, of course, the farther down you go, the more fibrous it gets. So we're going to go through. We're going to slice up that asparagus. And at that point, hopefully, our cauliflower is tender. And how we'll know? We will check its crushability. So if you can take a wooden spoon and kind of smash that cauliflower against the side of the pan and it basically just falls apart, it's done. And at that point, we can go ahead and raise our heat to high. 
and go ahead and dump in our asparagus and we'll give that a stir and please resist the temptation to dump in more liquid at this point. I know it doesn't look like there's enough and it's going to be too thick, but it's not. Asparagus and cauliflower are almost all water. So just stir it around, move it around, and there should be enough liquid to just cover. And then all we're going to do is stand right there with our wooden spoon. And we're going to cook this for about, I don't know, five or six minutes. Or until that asparagus is perfectly tender, yet still green. And there's only one way to do that, fish some out and test it. And if those pieces of asparagus still have a bite to them, still have kind of an undercooked grassy flavor, let it go another minute. So I kept checking mine. And after about five or six minutes, it was perfect. And at that point, we're ready to puree. Now you can do this very carefully in a few batches in a standard blender, but if you do have one of these immersion blenders, go ahead and use it. Works absolutely perfect for this. And we wanna go ahead and blend that absolutely smooth. And as you do, you're gonna see it turn into one of the most beautiful green colors ever. I like all shades of green, but I find this one particularly appetizing. And then once that's been processed completely smooth, you're pretty much done, except for like the most important step, taste for seasoning. I'm pretty sure you're gonna to have to stir in some more salt, You've heard me say it before, one of the only ways to screw up a soup is under season it. All right, it doesn't matter what's written on a recipe. When it comes to the final seasoning, it's up to you to massage your potage. So make sure you give it a final taste. And I know because I've trained you well, you want to add some heavy cream here or some creme fraiche or some butter or top it with bacon. But like I said, we're going to be good and keep this very light and wholesome. But anyway, once that tastes exactly how you want, we're going to go ahead and ladle that up into some warm bowls. And then we got a couple options for garnish. So you remember those tips I saved earlier? I went ahead and blanched those and cut them in little strips. And that kind of makes an interesting rustic garnish for the top. So I thought that looked pretty nice. But as I started eating the soup, which all kidding aside was quite delicious, by the way. As I started eating this, I realized this was kind of a dumb garnish. Why? Because I cut them too long. You do not want a soup garnish longer than the spoon. You could put out a nostril with that, okay? So I decided to go with version two, starring this, nasturtiums. In my opinion, the world's most beautiful edible flower and those grow semi-wild in my backyard, so I went out and picked a few. And I scattered some of the petals over the top. And then for a little contrast, I diced up some of those extra tips, which I think just makes for a stunning presentation. But anyway, crazy, colorful garnishes aside, this soup's beauty is more than skin deep. And yes, I'm not kidding, those are totally edible. And they really don't have much of a flavor, so really just for color. However, if you taste them by themselves, they do have a little bit of a peppery watercrust kind of flavor. But anyway, that's it, creamy asparagus and cauliflower soup. If you're looking for a very quick, pretty delicious, and incredibly nutritious soup, I really hope you give this a try. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info, as usual. And as always, enjoy! Enjoy!